Please take your copy of God's Word, turn to Romans chapter number 1, please. Romans chapter number 1. It is said that a good introduction should identify the topic, provide essential context, and indicate the particular focus of the letter, the speech, or the essay that follows. And writers will spend hours working to craft the introduction, to make it just right, to set up what is coming next. Well, the Apostle Paul used only seven verses to plant the seed of what flowers in the rest of the book of Romans. And in just a few words, he was able to, as one author noted, distill and condense the infinite truth of the gospel. In just a few words, seven verses, think about that. So join me, if you would, in Romans chapter 1, as we look at a powerful summary of the great and glorious gospel of God. God's Word says, beginning in verse number 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are, the called, to, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that you would guide and direct our time together as we look at your word. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have given us the freedom and the opportunity to come today together today to worship. Lord, we have worshiped in singing. We have worshiped through giving. Now we worship through hearing your word and applying it to our lives. So, Father, I pray for enablement that you might help as your word is communicated, not just help me in speaking it, but Father, help the people to hear and understand that you might be glorified by our response to your word today. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In these seven verses that comprise the greeting or the opening of the book of Romans, it's actually the longest of Paul's epistles as far as greeting is concerned. He, he spends more time really unearthing and fleshing out the truth of the gospel in the greeting than he does in any other book that he has written or letter that he's written. And really the message that we, we come back to as we look at this text is this, that the gospel is the good news that must be heard and understood. The gospel is the good news that must be heard and understood. Now, let's just kind of break that down, right? The gospel, the word gospel itself means good news. It means the, the news that we need to hear. There's, there's a lot of news out there that you can hear. Some of it is good news. A lot of the news that we get is bad news. The gospel is the good news that must be heard and understood. In other words, it's not enough for us simply to hear the good news. That's a good thing, and we're thankful for it, but the good news also must be not just heard, but also understood. You know, many times we think hearing something is enough. In fact, we're always hearing something. I did some research this week to find out what people are listening to, and this is what I came across. 1.7 billion people listen to at least one podcast every month. 1.7 billion people listen to at least one podcast every month. And I'm sure that many of you in this room listen to at least one podcast every month. A lot of people have their favorite podcasts and it just populates on their radio. And so they, they listen to it as they're driving back and forth or when they're working out or, or when they're sitting at work or whatever it may be. There's people almost constantly listening to podcasts. 270 million people listen to an audiobook every month through a service like Audible. Now, I've tried that before. I have the attention span of a toddler. And so 
I, I am not good at listening to audiobooks. They interest me for about 15 seconds, and then my mind is wandering all over the place, and I'm not really listening at all to, to what the dulcet tones of the narrator is telling me. I, I just lose it. I can't really focus that way. Maybe you can. More power to you. 270 million people, however, a month listen to an audiobook. 750 million people listen to a streaming music service every month. So that's Spotify, Apple Music, something like that. Think about the numbers, the sheer numbers, 750 million people. And then this one kind of caught me off guard. Four billion people, almost half of the entire global population, listen to the radio every month. So you would think that radio is a medium that is going out of vogue, right? That no one's really listening to radio anymore. Four billion people a month listen to to the radio. The point is this, that, that we as a people are always listening to something. But how often do you find yourself really hearing something without paying attention to it? In other words, it's, it's on and it's in the background, but you're not really paying attention to it. In other words, your senses tell you that there is audio playing. You hear it, your brain tells you that you're hearing it, but you're not really focused at all on what's being said, so you don't understand it at all. Now, I pray that doesn't happen today, right? I, I hope that I'm just not white noise for you while you're thinking about everything that you need to do this afternoon on a beautiful day where the temperatures are warm or everything that you need to do this week or even as you're contemplating what you're going to eat for lunch. I hope that I'm not just white noise in the background that you're hearing but not actually listening to. When it comes to the gospel, we must hear it. But more than that, we must understand it for a purpose. And what is the purpose? So that we get it right. The reality is there are a lot of gospels out there. Many profess to know the gospel, but the gospel they know isn't the gospel at all. For instance... Please tell me why anyone would think of doing good things, think that doing good things is required if you have any hope at all of being saved from God's wrath. That's not good news. Why? Well, because how many good things are required? And what happens if you do a bad thing? Does the bad thing erase the good thing? Think about it. That's... that's one of the things that people contemplate, and they think, well, this is good news. No, a, a gospel that says that you must perform certain things to receive grace and salvation is not a gospel at all. It's not good news. Consider this. Why is the prosperity gospel considered good news? What's good about the idea of, of needing to create within yourself a faith so strong that you can speak your own happiness and enrichment into existence? What happens when you don't? Yet there are false gospels everywhere. And I, I began to wonder, what makes false gospels so unbelievably attractive that millions, if not billions of people on the globe give themselves to false gospels and cling to them? I think there's a few reasons for it. I think the first thing is that false gospels typically feed our pride. False gospels are really centered around self, around one's own capacity to do good, around one's own capacity to earn God's love and affection, around one's own capacity by the force of their will to determine the outcome of their lives. That just stokes the fire of our default pride that, that, you know what, I am the master of my own life. And I'm the master of my own circumstance. I'm the master of the outcome. And so a lot of these false gospels just simply play into that. But I think there's a second reality as well, is that they promote self-reliance. There is within us a streak of independence. I don't want to have to rely on anybody for anything. And so, you know what? If I, if I can just do these things by the force of my will, by, by the sheer 
innate power of my character, if I can just do these things, then I don't have to rely on God. I don't have to rely on anyone else. I can secure for myself my own salvation. And I don't need anybody. Therefore, I, I, I'm not accountable to anybody. Ultimately, false gospels, every false gospel rejects the God of Scripture. They, they make little g gods, but they reject the God of Scripture. And this is the default position of the human heart. This is the default position of man. All you have to do is look down uh, a little bit further in the text in Romans 1, verses 18 through 23, to see that this is what humanity does. We suppress the knowledge of the truth of God. And by suppressing the knowledge of the truth of God, it gives us, or at least we perceive that it gives us, a license to live any way we want to live. And again, false gospels feed into those narratives. Hearing the, the true gospel, however, is good. In fact, we're going to see in the text today that everybody needs to hear the true gospel, but it is vital that we understand it. That's why coming to church is crucial to the spiritual development of the believer. Listen, the, the command was not given in Scripture that we do not forsake the gathering together just because God wanted to give us something to do on Sundays or because God was first and foremost worried about our social lives. No, the reality is God said, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together because when we gather together, we gather together for the purpose of of proclaiming and hearing the gospel so that we might understand it. The gospel must be communicated rightly so that we get it. And in getting it, we, we then are, are strengthened and encouraged. You don't have to go too far back in history. Four years ago, you all were watching online services. You remember that, right? I was thinking about that as I was preparing this message, and I thought about those days when we would come into this building, and the hallways were dark, none of the lights were on, the parking lot was empty, there was just maybe a dozen of us here, folks from the music team, folks from the production team, and, and I would sit up here on a little stool with a table in front of me and, and look back there at those cameras, and, and, and I would preach the gospel from the book of Habakkuk to a, a nearly empty room to cameras in the hopes that somebody somewhere was watching. But not just that they were watching, the hope was that they were actually listening and paying attention, but I had no idea whether they were or not. At least here I can see your faces. The unblinking eye back there isn't very friendly. And most of the time I can tell if you've checked out. Most of the time, I can tell if you're, if you're listening, if you're paying attention. That's the beauty of being in this room, surrounded by other believers. There's accountability. If you start snoring next to somebody, they're going to elbow you, right? I love to see when, when people are sitting there taking notes, notebook and pen in, in hand, and, and they're writing down the, the things that are being said. Why? Because they're, they're, they're making sure that they get the gospel right, that they're focused, that they're paying attention, that you're listening, because ultimately that leads to understanding. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about it in relation to how the church operates. This is actually one of the reasons why we have children's ministries and why we've built the family room in the back of the worship center. Why? So parents and the, and the rest of the people attending are not distracted and unable to listen and understand the message. It's too vital for you to miss it. It's actually based on a principle we find in the book of Nehemiah. After the, the wall was rebuilt around Jerusalem, they gathered to hear a sermon Nehemiah chapter number 8, listen to what he says. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. You hear the qualifier there. On the first day of the seventh month, and he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. Again, the qualifier. Qualifier. 
and the ears of all the people, men and women and hold who could understand, were attentive to the book of the law. They were paying attention. They could listen and understand it. And what happens every week in this room is the most important thing that happens in this building. A lot of things happen in this building throughout the week. But what happens in this room during this time is the most important thing. Why? Because it's the gospel that is being proclaimed. And we must not just hear it, but we must understand it. And I'll go so far as to say that if you don't put yourself in a position to hear the good news, not just on Sundays, but daily, then you don't really have any hope of understanding it the way it was intended to be understood. And when you don't understand the gospel, not only do you miss out the glorious implications and truths of the gospel, but you also open yourselves up and you become vulnerable to those who proclaim a false gospel. If you don't know the real thing and understand the real thing, you can be easily led astray by that which is not real by that which is not true. And so Paul wrote Romans so his listeners would become familiar, very familiar with and understand the gospel. The good news is the major theme of Romans. And so the introduction or the the greeting, which is really just one long sentence in the Greek language, is in fact a powerful summary of the gospel that Paul will unfold over the 16 chapters of the book of Romans. And Paul's point here is that the gospel is the good news that must be heard and understood. Now, what exactly does Paul teach us about the gospel? What what do we need to learn today? What do we need to understand about the gospel from the introduction? Well, let me show you three facts that you must understand about the gospel. First of all, the gospel was promised by God. Notice what he says at the end of verse number one. He says, Not only was he a a servant, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, but he was also set apart for the gospel of God. Let's break that phrase apart just a little bit to understand it, right? The one and only gospel, the good news of God. Of is the source, meaning this, that Paul is saying without any reservation, that this good news that must be heard, this good news that must be understood, is the gospel, the good news that comes from God, that has its source in God. That that he did not just make this up. He he didn't sit down one day and say, man, I I just really want to be an encouragement and I just really want to be a help to people. And so what can I do? What can I say? What can I write that might be encouraging to the people who read or hear uh, what I have to say? And then he sits down and and writes down what he thinks are some good ideas. No, he's saying, no, this, this did not come from me. This did not have its origin in myself or in any other person. The origin of this good news that I share is God himself. This is the gospel that comes from, that proceeds from God. Paul wanted to establish that the origin of the gospel was was not man's idea at all. Think about it. Who writes, what human being writes a story like the gospel? If you really know what the gospel is, you understand what the gospel says, It does not ever paint humanity in a flattering light, does it? What does it teach us about ourselves? It teaches us that we are moral lepers. It teaches us that we are spiritually bankrupt. It teaches us that we have absolutely nothing to offer to God that would be in His sight worthy of of redeeming us, of saving us. It says that we are utterly hopeless because we deserve nothing but the judgment of Almighty God. It says that, that we are entirely depraved, that we are completely incapable of changing our spiritual condition, that that we can't decide, you know what, I'm going to 
pick myself up by my spiritual bootstraps and I'm going to be the person that God wants me to be. In fact, it tells us that we want nothing to do with God. It tells us that we are rebels against God. It tells us that we are the enemies of God. There's nothing flattering in the gospel about humanity. Matter of fact, if all you do is is read the gospel and, and stop with what it says about humanity, you will rightly be discouraged. And the reality is we don't write stories like that about ourselves, do we? We don't even tell stories about ourselves that way, do we? No, when we tell people about things that we're doing, what we normally do is we take it and turn it to the best possible light. We might talk about our problems, we might talk about our failures, but ultimately then what do we do? We talk about how we have overcome those things and we present ourselves in the best light possible. I know pastors who whenever they they talk about themselves, they they present themselves as the, the hero of every story they ever tell. You're laughing because you know that to be true too. You typically don't have pastors stand up and talk about how rotten they've been that week. You don't typically have pastors stand up before the congregation and say, you know what, um, I, didn't, I didn't hardly get in my Bible this week at all except to study to preach. I had, my prayer life is an absolute wreck. My marriage is not what it's supposed to be. I'm a lousy parent. No, 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 no. What you get most of the time is the idea that the pastor has it all together. His walk with God is superior to any of yours. His marriage is perfect. His parenting is perfect. His finances are perfect. His time management is flawless. And you know what? Yeah, he has some temptation, but he overcomes it every single time. This is the way we want people to think about us. This is why no human being would ever be the source of the gospel. Because the gospel, from a human's perspective, it, it would never be what we truly are. It would be, listen, this is, this is what I've done to better myself. Screenwriters, film writers, book writers say one of the elements of telling a good story is to include compelling characters who are strong, characters who struggle with internal conflict that drives external struggle. Ultimately, the the characters written are strong enough to overcome their inner issues and, and find redemption through their own actions. This is the story that we would write about ourselves. And this is the complete opposite of the gospel of God. Because the gospel of God says that we are hopeless and helpless, that we are condemned. And if God didn't step in to save us, we would be forever and eternally lost. And so God is the originator of the gospel. This gospel, this good news is is not something he came up with on the fly, No, this is something that has existed before creation and and through his prophets, he promised the good news of deliverance from sin. This is what he's talking about. The gospel of God, verse number two, which he, God, promised beforehand in time past. How? Through his prophets. Well, how in the world did God promise the gospel? How did he reveal the gospel Beforehand, and time passed, through the prophets. Well, all you need to do is to think for, for a moment about Moses. Moses was a prophet of God, right? He wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And as he wrote the first five books of the Bible, what did he reveal starting in Genesis 1? That God created everything. I believe he created everything in six literal days. And, and that when he stepped back from his creative act, he He deemed that everything was very good, that it was exactly the way he wanted it to be, that that there was nothing that was 
off. There was nothing that was amiss. Everything was right according to God's purpose, God's design, God's plan. And so he rested on the seventh day. And, and so you have Genesis 1 and 2 describing God's creative acts. Man and woman there in the garden, married, enjoying life together as sinless creatures in a perfect and pure environment, enjoying a relationship with God because he created them so that he might love them and that they might love and serve him. And so they had a, a closeness and a fellowship. But then we get into chapter three. three. How much time passed between chapter two and chapter three? I don't know, but it probably wasn't long because you and I typically find trouble fast, right? <laughs> in chapter number three, we have Eve and the serpent comes and, and he tempts her and she takes the fruit that was forbidden, the fruit that she was not supposed to eat. She ate it, she gave it to her husband, her husband ate and mankind immediately fell in sin because they rebelled against the word, the, the, the instruction, the command of the creator. They set themselves up as their own God, said we don't have to listen to him. We're not interested in being the king's vice regents. We ourselves want to be kings and queens. And immediately the Bible says that they died. Spiritually, they died. Physically, their cells began to deteriorate, leading ultimately to physical death because God said in the curse that from dust you came, from dust you will to return. But in Genesis chapter 3, amid all of the chaos and disaster and destruction that, were, that was brought on by the fall of mankind in that first sin, in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, what happens? There is a promise made. Theologians call it the proto evangelium What is that? It means the first gospel. Because amid all of the bad news, what happens? God says to the woman, from your seed will come one. And he will crush the head, bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent's head will bruise his heel. It's the first bit of good news in a fallen world. That God will judge the tempter. That God will judge the enemy that God ultimately will be victorious, how? Through the seed of the woman. And guess who wrote that? The prophet Moses. As we progress into Genesis, we have a picture of Christ in the ark and the flood. We get to Abraham. And when we get to Abraham, we see that all the nations will be blessed by his seed. And we see later that Isaac is the promised son, and from Isaac comes Jacob, and God, uh, God chose, chose to work through Jacob and not Esau, and from Jacob came Judah, and from Judah would come the promised Messiah. This was all recorded by the prophet Moses. We get into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and, and what do we see? We see the, the sacrificial system, and we see the, the lambs being altered, and we see the sacrifices, and we see all of these shadows and types that are, are pointing to the one who is promised to come, the one who would die as the final sacrifice for his people, whose blood would be shed to cleanse those who believe from sin, making them right with God. We get a little further along and, and we come to a man by the name of David. It's revealed to David that from his seed, one would come who would sit forever on the throne, whose kingdom would be an eternal, everlasting kingdom. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we, we have prophets pointing to the one who would come pointing to the good news that God will not leave us alone to, to try to figure out our sinful condition, but he will send one who will come and pay the price for our sin, offering redemption and forgiveness of sin so that we might be reconciled to the one who created us. The prophets told us when and where the Messiah would be born, what his ministry would look like. The prophets told us that he would be a suffering servant. The prophets told us that he would die. The prophets told us that he would rise from the dead. In all, there are at least 332 prophecies recorded for us in the Old Testament, most of which have been fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. The Old Testament, friends, lays the groundwork for the coming of the new covenant. Covenant. 
This is what Paul is getting at. This gospel, this good news of God was promised beforehand at times past through the prophets in the Old Testament. And some say that we should ignore the Old Testament. They say, you know what, only focus on the New Testament, only preach the New Testament, only read the New Testament. Andy Stanley famously said that we must unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Why? His point was this, that we would not be taken seriously if we cling to the antiquated themes of the Old Testament. But look what Paul says about the Old Testament. Look how he describes it. He calls them the Holy Scriptures. The Old Testament, when he was writing, this is all they had. He says the Old Testament is the Holy Scriptures, the writings of God for his people. In fact, Paul quoted directly or paraphrased or alluded to the Old Testament 66 times in the book of Romans alone. Jesus confronted the religious leaders who opposed him in John chapter number 5. And listen to what he said to them. He said, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you religious elite, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. In other words, they were counting on their compliance with the law, their obedience to the law to secure for them everlasting life. And so they were looking, what laws do we fulfill? What laws do we fulfill? How are we supposed to live? And, and he says, you search the scriptures because you think that by keeping the law, you earn eternal life. And it is they, those scriptures that you search that bear witness about me. They're telling you about me. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he, Moses, wrote of me. Do you see it? He gave it to us in the prophets. Jesus says, Moses wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Listen, if you don't believe the Old Testament, you don't believe or you won't believe the new. You can, you can know easier to detach yourself from the Old Testament as a believer than you can detach yourself from the New Testament. God has given both and preserved both so that we might more fully know Him, that we might more fully know and understand the gospel. See, both Testaments were given so that we might be encouraged to live with hope. A lot of times we think, well, hope is found in the New Testament. The Old Testament is just history and condemnation and bloodshed and all of this stuff. But in Romans chapter 15, Paul says this, For whatever was written in former days, what's he talking about? The Old Testament. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, the Scriptures that existed, the Old Testament, we might have hope. In 1 Corinthians, Paul actually says, I think it's in chapter 10, that the Old Testament was given to us. The, the history of Israel was given to us so that we might receive instruction, that we might learn. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, let us never forget that there is nothing more comforting or encouraging to the Christian than to be familiar with the Old Testament Scriptures. He said, go back to your Old Testament Scriptures, read them, study them, learn them by heart. See God's method. Nothing so encourages us and so teaches us to exercise patience as the Old Testament does. Think about it. From the time that first gospel was given in Genesis chapter 3 until the, the incarnation of Christ was about 4,000 years. That's a lot of time, right? 4,000 years where people were waiting on the promise, waiting for this one who was promised to come, waiting for this deliverer. People lived and died and lived and died and lived and died, successive generations, until finally, at the time of God's choosing, 
Jesus was born. What does it tell us? It tells us that, you know what, God can be trusted. That that God has delivered on every promise that he's ever made. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, Solomon said. The point is this, that, that you can put yourself and everything that concerns you, everything you worry about, everything that causes anxiety, you can put all of that into the hands of God because you can trust him. That God will deliver on every promise that he's made. Now, that doesn't mean that you're never going to experience heartache. It doesn't mean that you're never going to experience pain. It doesn't ever mean that you're going to not experience difficulty. All of those are part of life as fallen people in a fallen world. God doesn't promise us. I don't care what the prosperity gospel preachers say. God doesn't promise us wealth, and God doesn't promise us a carefree, easy life. But for his people... He most certainly does promise to use everything that comes into our life, good and bad, for his ultimate purpose in us, which is what? To sanctify us that he might be glorified. What you need to see in verse 2 is that the gospel of God was promised beforehand that the gospel was promised by God. That leads us to the second fact. The gospel was fulfilled by Christ. Notice how verse number 3 starts. Concerning his son. So what was promised beforehand through his prophets and in the Holy Scriptures had to deal with or was in reference to his son. And what does he say about the son of God? Who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, in case you're confused about who this might be, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God's promise concerned His Son. Paul wanted us to know really two things about Jesus in these verses. First of all, he wanted us to understand and know that Jesus is, in fact, fully human. That that He is fully human in body, that He's fully human in soul, meaning this, that he has mind, will, and emotions. That Jesus wasn't just part man and part God, but that he was fully man and that he is fully God. Say, I don't understand how that works. Neither do I. But I know it's true. How do I know it's true? Because God says it's true. And and we... We see that in the life of Jesus, do we not? Think about the experience that Jesus had. Jesus got tired. You ever think about Jesus sleeping? But yet the Bible records the fact that he got tired one night and he laid down and he took a nap. He went to sleep. That's a very human thing to do, isn't it? He got hungry. He wanted something to eat. And then he got frustrated, he got angry when he went to a a, a fig tree that was in leaf. In other words, it should have produced figs, but there were no figs on it. And so he, he was angry at that and disappointed and frustrated because it wasn't what it should be. He got angry when he walked into the temple grounds and saw a bunch of money changers preventing the Gentiles from coming in and worshiping. He died on the cross. It's a very human thing to do. 100 out of 100 people die. Right? Think about it. The Lord tarries his coming. Every one of us in this room will die. No avoiding that. He died. That's what Paul means when he says that he was descended from David according to the flesh. 
because he was fully human and descended from David, then he is also then qualified to reign as Israel's king. But then the second part, he reveals that Jesus is fully divine. Verse number four, was descended or was declared or was appointed or designated to be the Son of God. It does not mean here that that Jesus was a good man who lived a good life and God said, okay, I'll make you my son. No, he was the eternal son. The first part is the incarnation, or all of this is really about the incarnation. Declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So maybe think about it this way. If if Jesus was fully human when he got tired and he laid down and went to sleep, then he was fully God when he stood up on the ship and said, peace be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed his voice. If he was fully man when he got angry with the fig tree that wasn't producing, then he was fully God when he cursed the tree and it withered and died. Listen, I can kill a tree, but I can't do so by my word. If if he was fully man when he died on the cross, then he was absolutely fully God when he rose from the dead three days later. Do you see it? Paul is unveiling before us here the, the mystery and the glory of the incarnation. Jesus Christ is fully divine because he is the Son of God. The incarnation is a wonderful truth. He said he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. Declared by God at his baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. In power, Jesus did only what no one else, Jesus did what no one else could do. In purity, Jesus was the absolute Holy One. And by his resurrection, Jesus proved beyond any doubt that he was the Son of God. How? By defeating death and walking out of the grave. There's, there's a relatively famous saying that says, don't just tell me, show me. The point is simple. Anyone can say anything, but you're convinced when you see actions that back up the claim. Amen. Through his life, Jesus verified the truth of the gospel. In his death, he verified the, the fact that the, the gospel is true, that one came to die for the sins of of the world. And then in his resurrection, he verified the truth of the gospel that God is fully pleased with the sacrifice of his son. And God the Son rose from the dead. One of the titles ascribed to Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Is there any more comforting thought possible in the world than the fact that God is with us. And that he came, what? To give life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, thus is written, the first, Adam, or the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That Jesus came, lived, and died to give life to those who believe. But there's something else here to think about, and that's the fact that Jesus is a living Savior. He is right now alive. His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, is a living Savior. He is alive. And think about this. Part of his ministry is that he intercedes for us. Hebrews 7.25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. What an astounding thought that Jesus Christ, the living Savior, makes intercession. He prays for us. Not only does he pray for us, but he also makes it possible for us to enter the very throne room of heaven and approach God boldly so that we might find the help that we need in time of trouble. What a glorious truth. The gospel was promised by God. It was fulfilled by Christ. That brings us to the third fact The gospel is enjoyed by those who believe. Through Jesus, all who believe receive grace. We see that in verse number five. Through whom, talking about Christ, we have, 
right now, this is a truth statement, we have received grace. What is grace? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Unmerited, it can't be bought. It can't be earned. It can only be given freely. We, those who believe in Christ, have, have received grace. But we've also received a commission. You see, the word apostleship, this is different than the word apostle in verse number one. The word apostle in verse number one refers to an office, an office occupied by only 12 men. When we get down to apostleship, he's talking about really the function. And the function is what? To serve as a representative. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that we believers are emissaries, that we are ambassadors, that we, we, we go forth into the world representing the king. Here he says, it has been given to us apostleship, meaning this, that, that we have, a, a, com, we have a, a, a commission on our lives to live as his representatives in this world and to declare consistently his message. We, plural, Paul, was given this commission. We, every believer since, has been given this commission to live as God's representatives for really two purposes. The first one is found in the, in the phrase to bring about the obedience of the faith. What does that mean? Well, some people think it's an either-or situation. In other words, it, it can mean that we proclaim the good news of salvation through faith in Christ and that through the, the sharing of the gospel, it results in people obeying God by hearing the gospel and believing it. Others have the idea that it means that we go forth and we share the message of the gospel with others and that then obedience springs from people believing it. In other words, people begin to live obedient lives because they believe the gospel. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's an and both. What happens when we, the, the message is given is that it results in obedience to the faith. People believe the gospel and are saved. And then, because they have believed the gospel and are saved, then obedience springs from their life. That they live lives of obedience to God and his purpose. That's the first purpose. The second purpose is found in the phrase, for the sake of his name among all the nations. For the sake of his name. What does that mean? It means to bring glory to God. Why have we received grace? Why have we received apostleship? Why have we received this commission to bring about the obedience of faith and ultimately to glorify God? And Paul makes it clear that this is the mission of everyone who has been called to belong to Jesus Christ, including you, that's plural, who are called. This word called is the same one found in verse number one. It means to be summoned. He's saying you were summoned to belong to Jesus Christ. There's an interesting little theological truth here, and that is this. Paul wasn't saying that these Romans, they had decided themselves to seek after Christ and to seek after salvation. No, no, they were happy living in their sin, but Christ summoned them to himself. And quite honestly, if we were not summoned by the act and power of God to believe in Christ, none of us would be saved and we wouldn't care that we were lost. So we see here These purposes for which we have received grace and apostleship. It tells us that life isn't about us, that life has a greater meaning, life has a greater purpose. It's ultimately about glorifying God. And some say life is best enjoyed by doing what you want. They say that license brings the greatest pleasure, the greatest satisfaction, the, the greatest fulfillment. Ironically, those who say that typically find misery in life. <laughs> 
But the greatest joy and the greatest fulfillment is living in obedience to God and for the glory of God. And why in the world would you live for God's glory and not for your own purpose? Well, that's seen there in verse number 7, because you are loved by God. You don't deserve to be loved by God, but you are. And you have been called by God to be saints. Again, called, the word summoned. That you didn't decide to be a saint, you didn't look to be a saint, but God summoned you to salvation and made you a saint. That you have received grace from God, or grace of God from God through Christ. That you have received peace with God from God through Christ. This is why, brothers and sisters, the the gospel is the good news that must be heard and understood. This is why it's been given to us. This is why it's been entrusted to us. This is why we, we must not only receive it, but we must believe it and understand it and share it. And this is why you've got to get the gospel right. Because you need the gospel. So, well, I'm already saved. Well, the gospel isn't just leading you to salvation. The gospel is the A to Z of the Christian life, not just the ABCs. You need the gospel. Others around you need the gospel. They need to hear it. They need to understand it and be saved. Paul's concern was that the Romans would get the gospel right because so much is riding on it. Do you understand the gospel? Do you believe the gospel? Is the gospel right now making an impact in your life? If you've got the gospel right, it will. Father, thank you for the time that we've had together today. Bless, I pray. Your word as it has been given. Father, I I ask that you would take the seed that has been planted today, cause it to spring up into life. That if there's anyone here in this room, anyone watching right now, who does not know you, who has not believed the gospel, who has not come to the obedience of the faith, Lord, I pray that they would understand their need for a Savior. Lord, the God of this world has blinded their eye and their own spiritual depravity. They, they don't see their need for a Savior and they don't see the need to rely on Jesus alone. But Father, I pray that you would remove that blindness, help them to understand and see their desperate condition apart from Christ that they might believe and be saved. Father, I pray for those who are saved, who have responded to the gospel, that, Lord, the gospel that we, would, we believe, the grace that we've received would lead to obedience of the faith, that, that we would live obediently before you, and that we would glorify you in everything that we do. Lord, that we would trust you because you are fully worthy of our trust, that we would enjoy the relationship we have with Christ through faith. Have your way in every heart and life, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.